All right, folks. It looks like we are ready to start. So let's go. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us and welcome to the Global Mission Summit 2021. I'm Nalini. And I'm Rich. And we are so excited to be your hosts for this virtual conference, Joining Jesus on the Road to Mission. From Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right to the living rooms, offices, churches that we find ourselves in right now. And as of right now, we have 562 people registered for Global Mission Summit 2021. Yeah, and Rich, that's representing 28 countries in five continents, five provinces in Canada, and 30 states in the U.S. That is amazing. So friends, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. And let me say this first, we realize that it can get overwhelming with a lot of details. So we will be repeating a lot of these instructions throughout the conference. There will be slides with the imp information to help you out as well. And then on this virtual platform, hop in. This is new for many of us, but you're here. So you know how to get to the stage. We're excited about that. And then here on the stage is where we will kick off each session we're gonna hear from our plenary speakers, and then we're gonna to move to our panel of storytellers. Awesome, thanks, Nalini. And over on the left side of your screen over there is where you'll find the big three tabs that say stage, where you are, sessions, and expo. Stage is where we are, then the sessions tab is where you'll find table conversations, tomorrow's breakouts, and lunch. We'll tell you more about that. Yeah, and then also in that panel there on the left, is the expo tab and that's where you will find our global help desk so if anything goes wrong just head over there now the expo tab also features different missional initiatives for example like go local sounds and like local but it's not <laughs> good one rich there's also the calvin theological seminary and resonate opportunities for engagement and more so explore the platform, take advantage of the table conversations, the expo, all of it. And remember, participants that visit at least three different expo booths, lunch sessions, table conversations are also going to be entered into a drawing for one of nine signed copies of David Fitch's book, Faithful Presence, Seven Disciplines That Shape the Church for Mission, which is awesome. So we encourage you, get into it, enjoy it, engage. And for conference details, keep your program booklet handy. Now you should have received a link for that in your email, but you can also scroll down and click the link below the stage. I know there is a lot to communicate, to learn, to experience over these next few days, but let's begin by acknowledging God's presence among us, expressing gratitude for this time, asking God's blessing as we seek his face, and clarity to hear his voice in this time together. So I'd invite you, wherever you are, to just take a deep breath, to center yourself in the place where you are, and let's pray together. God, it is indeed your breath in our lungs, and so we begin our time together by praising you. We thank you for this time, this weekend, this moment where you are present, we thank you that in every living room and office and church and school, in every place we find ourselves, your presence precedes us. And we give you thanks and pray that you would open our hearts to you, open our hands to receive what you have for us, open our eyes to see you active in our world, and open our ears to hear what you are saying to us in our contexts and churches and neighborhoods and countries and throughout this world. Jesus, you declared that we would bear witness to you in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. May this event, Glocal 2021, be a manifestation of your promise, your command. Take our feet and place us on the road to mission with you, we pray. Amen. Amen. And now, people loved by God, grace mercy and peace be ours in abundance from god our father through jesus christ his son our lord and by the power of his very present holy spirit amen and our world belongs to god and we also acknowledge those who are made in god's image who came before us in the lands where we are presently situated 
For me in Calgary, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 in Southern Alberta. Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And in Grand Rapids, we acknowledge the people of the Three Fires, the Ottawa, Ojibwa, and the Potawatomi peoples on whose unceded land we live and work. And we'd encourage you to acknowledge the same, wherever you are joining from, consider the history and the place and God's abiding presence. Now, as we transition, I'd like to note that the scripture focus for the summit is Acts 1.8 and Luke 24, 13 to 35. This is printed in your program booklet for your reference. And now friends, we are super excited to introduce our first Global Mission Summit speaker, Dr. David Fitch. David Fitch is the B.R. Linder Chair of Evangelical Theology at Northern Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. He's a Christian and Missionary Alliance ordained minister, church planter, coach of leaders, and writer. David is the author of many insightful articles on mission, featured often in Christianity Today and Beyond, with several books on mission, including Faithful Presence. We are very pleased that he is with us, and though we won't hear that big applause over the internet, please welcome David Fitch. All right, so as we continue to figure that piece out, we are actually going to go ahead and skip ahead. And one of the things that we wanna do here is we'll, we'll welcome David back on the stage here as well. But first, we wanna, we wanna bring our storytellers here. So beginning in Jerusalem, we consider mission close to home. And we have three storytellers who are going to share for a brief four minutes, each on what the road to mission looks like in their context. And as you listen, Please put questions for our storytellers and for David Fitch in the stage Q&A on the right side of your screen. Now, not the chat section. Please make sure to click on the stage Q&A tab. And then after their presentation, we'll have a chance to interact with your questions. So first, let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Karen Wilk from Edmonton, Alberta. Karen is a Go Local leader with Resonate. She also serves with the Forge Canada national team as their neighborhood life lead. And she's a champion for joining God in the neighborhood. So welcome, Karen. One of the things that David often talks about, and I've had the privilege of learning from him, is the power of presence. And one of the ways that I've been practicing that in my neighborhood is by going for regular walks with neighbors. One day, as we walk together pre-COVID, we got into a conversation about book clubs and one of my co-walkers who was in a book club besides our neighborhood one described how in that group they had just had a gathering at which they had each told about an inspirational book that they had read and really liked my spidey got at work sensors lit up well i said i like inspirational books what did you read she then inquired as to what i was reading and I told her that I was currently going through a book called Alter in the World, which was all about everyday spiritual practices. She thought it sounded interesting and wondered if she could have a look at it. I said, of course, I'll pop it in your mailbox after our walk. Within 24 hours, the book was back in my mailbox with a note saying, we should get some neighbors together to talk about this. My non-religious neighbor, wanted to set up a group to discuss a book about everyday spiritual practices written by an Episcopalian priest and professor of religion. What was God up to? By the end of the week, she and her husband had seven other neighbors committed to meeting every Monday afternoon to talk about the book chapter by chapter. And not only to talk about it, but to actually do the practices my non-Christian neighbors had just set up what most church folks would call a small group with serious accountability included. We took turns hosting in our homes, in cozy family rooms with tea on cooler days, outside on nicer days, and always with plentiful snacks. As David will talk about, eating together is formational. 
and transformational. We shared our experiences with, and sometimes our confessions of not engaging in the recommended practices. Practices such as silence, slowing down, gratitude and Sabbath keeping. Our conversations were growing incredibly open, honest, deep and meaningful. I have trouble being silent in my head, said one of my neighbors. How do you do that? I usually catch myself working on my to-do list or wondering what's for dinner. Another said, I'm feeling so grateful these days. But if I don't believe in God, to whom am I saying thank you? Maybe I do believe in some higher power after all. We were listening to and learning from each other, experiencing and talking about God, church, what it means to be human and what it means to love. One week, when thankfully the weather was nicer, the practice was going barefoot. Going barefoot, said the author, makes you slow down and pay attention to the beauty and intricacies around you. It is intended to lead you to a place of quiet reverence. That week, we happened to be meeting at the initiating couple's home. As we arrived, they invited us to take off our shoes and socks and go for a barefoot stroll around their little backyard until we arrived at their patio and took a seat. We took a seat and remained quiet. A moment or two later, husband and wife were coming out of the house, not with refreshments. Those came later in abundance, but with a basin of warm, sudsy water and fresh towels. And they insisted on washing all of our dirty feet. I was speechless. There, there was Jesus in my neighbors. When the emotion that had welled up in me settled and down enough for me to speak, I told the story of Jesus doing the same thing, washing the dirty feet of his followers. And I confess that I doubted I would have been willing to or even thought of washing their dirty feet. I shared my great gratitude and my awe over what they had just done, allowing us without them perhaps knowing it, to meet Jesus in them. I felt like Jacob when he woke up and declared, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't even know it. What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. We're going to go ahead and move on. I think we're going to go and move to David Lundberg. So let me introduce David, the next story, our next storyteller here. David Lundberg is an elder and a lay leader from Shawnee Park CRC in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he served on the Go Local guiding team. And he's going to share a little bit with us about their church's journey into the neighborhood. So welcome, David. Thank you. When I drive or ride my bike around Grand Rapids, I often see signs at churches that say, come, join us. You've seen them where you live. When our church council heard about Go Local when we joined it, they had questions. What kind of program is it? What are the goals? We really didn't know at that point. We didn't understand that Go Local is about changing the culture of our congregations. Someone might ask, well, what's wrong with our church's culture? That's not a good question to answer. You'd probably get in trouble. But we're discovering that Go Local is not a program or even a formula. It's about seeing differently ourselves, our neighbors, but most of all, God. We've heard the invitation to join the work that God is already doing in the neighborhood. Well, what's that all about? It wasn't, you too can increase attendance by 10% or Discover three easy steps for attracting millennials. No formula or guarantee. Our journey has helped us to see how the church, our church, has unwittingly embraced secular metrics of success. Full sanctuaries, dynamic worship services, you name it. Do those terms describe your congregation? Believing that God is already at work in our neighborhood is helping to free us from the trap of trying to be like the church across town. We can't be a Willow Creek. We can only be us. And we are gradually discovering what that means. First of all, 
God has placed us at 2255 Tecumseh Drive in Grand Rapids, no place else. Second, we've been given the permission to experiment. Experiments don't fail, they're marvelous, they're scary. And we've done at least a dozen of them in the last three years. I hope we never stop it. Thirdly, we're learning to listen, really listen to each other, to our neighbors, and most of all, to God's spirit. If God has been here all along, it makes sense that there's something God wants us to know. And then finally, prayer. Don't forget the prayer. Through prayer, ownership changes from our desires to God's dream for us. Luke 10 story and also Acts 1-8 has helped us to take small steps out of our comfort zones, two by two. Obedience is certainly not easy, but it's required, but two is a lot less scary than one. When COVID-19 intruded last year, Go Local was already preparing us to think differently. For example, our worship people identified two new sanctuaries right under our noses, our hidden back lawn and the parking lot. They've been there all along, but we haven't noticed them. Now we are seeing them and using them. Now our neighbors can see us and hear us as well. Recently, we held a four week discussion based on the book by Tim Sporens, Everywhere You Look. He asks the question, what is the church for? That question forces us to think differently about the church. He quotes Bono, stop asking God to bless what you are doing but find out what God is doing. It is already blessed. Go local through people like Tim Sporens and Bono and our uh, cohort mentors are saying that we are more than a building in the neighborhood where club members go once a week. We're called to be for the neighborhood and with it. To be sure our journey has no finish line and turning back is not an option. The Holy Spirit is leading us in one direction, and that is forward. Anticipation and excitement are gradually replacing the predictable and safe. Changing the cultures of congregation can make grass growing seem speedy. But as our eyes gradually open, we are starting to see and be where God has had us all along. The come join us invitation on the church sign is one mindset, but there's another mindset. God's invitation to us. Come, join me where I am already. Thank you very much, David. And we'll hear a little bit more from David again. But moving on to our next storyteller, I want to welcome Tehu Lee. He's coming in from North Philly. And Tehu is a pastor, teacher, a world class outreacher. He has a heart and calling to be a neighbor to the poor, and he's deeply immersed in a missional urban context. So welcome, Tehu. Hi, everyone. I was born and raised in Seoul, South Korea. In 1994, when I was 29 years of age, I came to Philadelphia to study at Westminster Theological Seminary. My intention was to go back to Korea when I was done. However, God had a different plan. At Westminster, I was challenged by the idea of incarnational ministry through Dr. Harvey Kahn and Dr. Manny Ortiz. As I plunged myself into the gospel narrative, that's what I saw Jesus doing with his disciples. He lived in the periphery of the empire and built a beloved community with the marginalized, collectively known as the tax collectors, sinners, and prostitutes. In 2003, I sensed God calling me to be a neighbor to the poor, and I moved into the North Philly neighborhood, which became my home ever since. The picture you see was, is going to tell you about my neighborhood. It is a predominantly African-American inner city neighborhood. And I used to rent a room from the house in the picture for six years. When I first moved into North Central neighborhood, Properties were abandoned and many were collapsing. As this heat map shows, gun violence is rampant in my neighborhood. And all the dots are where somebody was killed during those few months of 2007. So 
How do I imagine God's kingdom in this place of despair? When you learn to be a good neighbor, not just a resident, God surely shows up in a tangible way. In 2006, I started a month-long summer camp for the children in my neighborhood. This is block where I live, and every summer, it's turned into a haven. Since 2006, we had 100 plus campers singing praise songs and learning the message of hope. On Thanksgiving, we deliver 100 plus turkey baskets to our neighbors. In December, we invite families to a Christmas dinner party where my neighbors are served on the table and children are given presents by an African-American Santa. Over the years, children began to have new dreams. It was only because they experienced the simple but powerful message of the gospel, God loves you. As my camp was offered free of charge, and as the volunteers came back year after year, they now believe that God does love them regardless of their skin color or the dire poverty they were born into. As children began to dream of different future, parents began to change. This year, I have two high school seniors heading to college. Can you imagine what kind of message that can send to the entire community? As racism, which is one of the original sins of this country, is ravaging our community, I realized that my camp did something I did not plan to achieve. Racial reconciliation was happening over the years. Most of my volunteers are Korean Americans from suburban neighborhood. As these two foreign groups have interacted over some 15 years, they began to understand each other better. They were not mere labels to each other anymore. They became friends and neighbors. Even some Muslim families sent their children to my camp for they saw something beautiful. I do not have a church, but most of the neighbors see me as their pastor, including, including the drug boys around the corners. So what is God doing in my neighborhood? He's restoring shalom in my community. My neighbors, young and old, saw it happening, and they are expecting more to come. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tehu. In just a few minutes when we have a chance to do Q&A, as a reminder, please put your Q&A in the stage Q&A section on the right side. And we are actually going to go back and see if we can get David Fitch's video going, and then we're going to come back to the storytellers. Greetings, everybody, on this opening session of the Global Mission Summit 2021. It's a, a great privilege and honor to uh, be able to be with you and uh, present a little bit about uh, incarnational presence. I think it's not inconsequential that one of the first places Jesus appears after the resurrection is to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We're not told exactly what's going on here, why these two guys are on their way uh, to Emmaus, but after the events of the previous three or four days, after all of what's going on, all of the mayhem and chaos, they are most likely trying to make their way back to their regular lives again. They're trying to make their way back and get on with the living. They're still mostly in shock, probably. They're still processing everything, all that's happened. Um, but it's in the midst of their walking along the way, while they are talking and processing and reflecting and trying to make sense out of everything, that Jesus comes near. Verse 16, I mean 15 says, 
While they were walking together, talking and discussing, along the way, Jesus came near. Imagine like the day of the resurrection, the most momentous day in all of history. Jesus doesn't hold a mass celebration event. He doesn't hold a party. He doesn't even hold a church service. Instead, he becomes present to his disciples in the midst of their living, in the midst of their processing, in the midst of their struggles. Jesus comes near. I think it's so instructive. I think this is the way Jesus works. I believe God who is revealed in Christ works this way. He comes to be present and make himself known in the walking, in the midst of living everyday life. So more than um, something we do, uh, more than a program at our local church, mission is about a, a way of life. Mission is a whole way of life. It's something we do in our walking, in our living, our day-to-day -day walk. I call this presence. It's, it's so central to the way I have come to understand mission. In, in this text, we see three things about presence. First, presence is proximity. Jesus says, I mean, verse 15 says, Jesus came near, close. He joined them in their lives. He does not ask them to come to a meeting he's holding, say, on the beach. No, it's in the living, in the walking, that Jesus becomes known. Presence is also posture. Jesus comes, it says, alongside them, verse 15, or some translations say he went with them. That word with is really important. He's not coming over them. He's not coming to exert control or posture. No, he even comes and enters into their home as a guest. This is all uh, part of the posture of mission, of presence. Notice also, though, that presence is social. In verse 15, it says, while they were walking together, talking, discussing, his presence becomes, uh, he becomes present, he becomes near. They don't even know who he is, but he is among them. It's a social space. It's a place of talking, of discussing, of working out problems that Jesus becomes near. Think of that proximity, posture, social space. A social space for years, you know, uh, us Protestants have thought of presence as a personal subjective experience, something we feel, kind of like in a rock concert. Uh, the Roman Catholics, you know, they, the real presence is in the bread and the cup, transubstantiated into Christ's body and blood. That's real presence. But uh, as true and as important as those two things are, uh, no, Jesus becomes present in social realities, social spaces among us. So I believe presence is foundational, the first step towards mission. Uh, but notice then as the sojourners uh, reach the end of their journey, a wonderful thing happens. Jesus walks ahead. He he's, uh, acts like he's going on to another destination. It's late. And so the, the uh, two disciples go, hey, stay with us. Stay with us. Be present with us. It's late. Come with us. And so he goes, and they sit around a table. And when he's at the table with them, he takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, distributes it. That's what verse 30 says. Jeffrey Wainwright famously 40, 50 years ago said these are the code words for the practice of the Lord's table that all the churches practiced. And so while they're sitting around this table, practicing eating together, tending to his presence, he, their eyes are opened, it says, and they recognized him. 
Jesus became known in the practice of eating together around a table. I believe it's, uh, it's, a, it's a rather deep, thick theological concept. But I believe the table illustrates a fundamental dynamic of mission. We need practices of eating and other practices like reconciliation and being with the poor. And these practices uh, shape us into his presence and he is recognized and he becomes known and he's able to work. We emphasize in our church though that the table just doesn't stay uh, on Sunday morning. It is, it's not, that's not the only table. There are the tables in the neighborhood, in our homes, where we gather with Christians to tend to the presence of Jesus Christ at work in our lives, our daily lives. And we also emphasize the presence of Christ in our places of mission, where we sit and eat and share a beverage, say, at the homeless shelter or the local bar where several hurting people hang out or the school systems where they're dealing with untold issues or the happy hour at a local apartment building or or let's say at the town ordinance committee where they're trying to you know make uh, state uh, um, ordinances about what restaurant can come or what kind of people we can have here all these things are going on and I believe they're social spaces where God is at work. You see, there's not just one table, there's three. And what we learn and discern together on Sunday extends into the rest of the work of the week. I believe it's communities like this that live the practices in three spaces, three tables that Jesus uses to change the world. Don't forget Vince, I was reading Vince Harding on the SNCC communities where Persons of color and white persons in the Jim Crow South in the 50s and 60s ate together and prayed together and broke up the, the hegemony of the Jim Crow South. Um, uh, my friend Bill Cavanaugh, famous for writing Torture in the Eucharist, based communities in uh, Peru, I know Chile, sorry, uh, there, uh, base communities. Uh, practicing resistance against the torturous regimes of Pinochet had a role in breaking that regime up. We see it time and again in history. God uses these transformative, powerful communities to disrupt and make space for the presence of Jesus to work. So we have presence first and then these practices of the table and other practices where we gather together with people an open space for Jesus to work. But lastly, my last comment here is, um, you know, something amazing happened as Jesus is revealed around the table. It says, quote, they recognized their hearts were burning within them. And so instead of staying in their homes, getting, you know, back into their regular lives, going back to normal, it says the same hour they got up, returned to Jerusalem returned to where it all started. And they're going to go back there and they're going to witness to what they've seen. All their, chain, all their plans were changed. And so along the way, in their walking, in their living, Jesus becomes known and, and their lives are changed. And so we see here what happens with incarnational presence in the neighborhood. We see how little communities everywhere making space for the presence of, of God in Christ can disrupt the systems, the, the, the racist systems in our towns, the broken cycles of poverty and broken relationships, uh, restore people uh, out of um, some of their cycles so that they can have homes again. Yes, presence. Yes, table, but transformation and witness. In my life and in our church, I've noticed how these little fellowships start in the neighborhood. It usually starts uh, in a home with 10 to 12 adults. It takes a while to get things started, but 10, and 12, 10 to 12 adults start and they gather around a meal. We, many times we just bring food 
Uh, these these groups are sometimes in, by the way, not just homes, but in bowling alleys or garden clubs or even the YMCA, other places, homeless shelters. It usually starts with the meal. We share food together and we start talking about our lives for the first hour. What's going on with you? What have you been up to? How is that struggle with so-and-so or that struggle with your job or, your or that struggle with the, with the town village committee? Somewhere about an hour in, a question usually is posed by a leader uh, that helps us probe God and who he is and how he's working. Scripture is opened. Uh, and after a wonderful exploration, uh, we pray for a half an hour. Months go by. You know, it takes months to build confidence and trust in one another. But as we grow in trust, a space is opened up for the power in the presence of Jesus to do his work. And we notice someone with a, an addiction for years loses it. We notice that someone who had a mental illness blurts out something very uh, coercive. And we practice reconciliation and a healing happens. Someone's marriage ends up not breaking up because they saw someone else's marriage go through the same problems a few years ago and it worked out. And Jesus is recognized. His presence is made manifest. You know, and people go, wow, I can't believe I saw that. And a whole church can catch fire with one little group of 12 people, 12 adults and children meeting on a Friday night in the neighborhood. A racial divide in our town not only reveals the struggle between police policing and persons of color in our neighborhood. But in a prayer walk, uh, after the murder of George Floyd, um, we, in, a, in a meeting, we see a progress starting between the police chief and various people groups in our neighborhood. And the word starts getting around along the way while we were walking in the living, in just the daily living of struggles of life, Jesus becomes near. He becomes present. He becomes known. He becomes recognized. And he works. And transformation begins. And we become witnesses to the kingdom. And by the way, people get saved. I pray presence, table, and transformation become part of the way each of us lives and walks with our neighbors, our towns, our villages. I pr pray the themes and discussions of this conference thicken our imagination, not just for mission as a program at our local church, but mission as a whole way of life. Uh, so that along the way, in our walking, in the living, space is opened up for Jesus, for his presence to be made known. May God bless uh, the Global Mission Summit 2021. And I can't wait to talk some more and answer questions. Amen. Thank you so much, David, and for that important reminder of our call to incarnational presence in our communities and how it's in our daily living that Jesus becomes known. So thank you for that. And Tehu, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're going to wait and see if a couple of our other storytellers are also going to be available. But I'm going to move ahead here to the Q&A. And we have a couple of questions that are that are popping up here. And for those of you that have questions, once again, I know this is repetitive, but please put that in the stage Q&A section. And then I will uh, ask each of our uh, storytellers here. And I'll, I'll get that going. So actually, David Lundberg, there was a question that came for you here. And folks would like to know, what were some of the Shawnee Park experiments? Well, we started out with a hosting trick-or-treat when it rained and was cold, and we ended up <clears throat> with an open house. 
130 people came inside for washrooms and candy and hot chocolate. And basically that was rained in, um, not rained out. Uh, that was our first one. Then we've done, we've given out uh, messages of hope and Easter lilies at Easter. We brought about 50 people together to carve pumpkins in our parking lot or one of our sanctuaries. Um, and then this whole worship thing has been an experiment experiment all by itself. And, uh, and that was in the spirit of experimentation. So those are just some examples. Thank you. Um, David Fitch, there's a question that came here for you. And um, one of our participants says, I love the emphasis of presence, especially eating with people and being near to people's lives. This seems more difficult during COVID. Do you have any suggestions on how to practice presence during restrictions? Yeah, well, let's first recognize that, oh, my light bulb is going on and off. This is just another, I think this could be. Folks, the technology problems could be all me. Uh, anyways, um, I, I think, first of all, COVID, let's just realize people are hungering for presence. COVID has just a, a allowed or made space for everybody to finally say, I am a lonely person. I am longing for something more. My life is devoid of presence and the, and the work of God. And, and they might not even know that that's what it is. So let's just recognize that this is going to be difficult. But then secondly, let's be inventive. At our church, we put little notes in everybody's mailbox. Um, we know we're going through tough times here, COVID-19. We know you might need something or you might not feel safe going to the grocery store. Here's my email. Here's my phone number. Uh, we'll try to help in any way we can. Our church did that up and down the neighborhoods of our, our little uh, suburb here. And uh, I'm telling you, we have met and been present with many people uh, like we have never been because of that opportunity to engage. I'll just say one other thing. Uh, uh, we have many social struggles in our time. And we did a, uh, a what we called a prayer walk, but it was a march for justice up and down our streets shortly after the George Floyd murder. And we met more neighbors and we spent more time walking with masks on six feet apart. And these little inventive moments, I think, are preparing the way for a massive new outbreak. Um, well, I don't want to get it's going to God's going to work once the restrictions start to unwind. Thank you, David. Uh, maybe a question for all of you here. So you you've laid out uh, pretty clearly this missional challenge. And let's say my local congregation wants to respond. What would you say would be one of the first steps we could take? Any of you can jump in here. Well, as David communicated, the initiative that to resonate is uh, offering to come alongside congregations on the Go Local journey, which is all about recognizing God's agency and learning to listen to the spirit and our neighbors so that we can begin to uh, join God in our neighborhoods. So that would be one thing uh, for, for individuals or households uh, doing what David's been saying, just start by walking around your neighborhood and paying attention. What is the spirit delighting in? What is the spirit lamenting? Where can you connect with and be present with your neighbors as a listener, mm -hmm. as a social coordinator, even in COVID? Um, that, that would be some of the things I would suggest. Yeah. Anyone else want to? Yeah, David Lumber. I've heard uh, elsewhere that the speed of Jesus' ministry was three miles an hour, <laughs> which is the speed of walking. And we have really uh, abandoned that in favor of cars or even bikes. And so what Karen said, I think is so true. Slow down, connect, notice, engage as part of, uh, it's, it's really pretty simple when it comes down to it, when you think of it like that. Hmm. And there was a question that came in the chat that may be connected to that because uh, somebody is wondering, how do introverts uh, get involved and get to know their neighbors? Well, I got a suggestion. I'm, I don't think I am an introvert, but, um, you know, every one of our attempts to engage a uh, neighborhood context, there's always somebody like me, an apostle that goes first, goes and sits in a particular place or ministers in a particular 
a presence to a particular place and then invites others along with them. And uh, they must be assured, all you have to do is sit and listen and come alongside with me. Uh, yeah. It takes a loud mouth, well, I, I, loud mouths, frankly, are not good, period. So if you're a loud mouth out there, be a gentle, quiet, mouth, loud mouth, but lead yeah. into territories and invite those who are not loud mouths because they're probably going to do most of the good work anyways. You're just going to sit there. I could tell a long story about how this dynamic has worked so many times in my life. I end up starting something, and then the introvert is the one who absolutely uh, God uses to transform people's lives, and I'm just sitting there watching. <laughs> Thank you, David. Now, Tehu, there's a question here for you, and one of our participants asked this question. says, what did the Spirit do in your heart and the hearts of others to develop a posture of openness to your Philly neighborhood. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So I think uh, what the spirit did was um, kind of help me and uh, my kind of uh, co-workers to overcome the racial divide and also class divide. Uh, that's, you know, our society is very, uh, hugely working on and instead uh through you know the parable of good samaritan uh god allowed us me uh, especially me to see these um, neighbors in the inner city um as the one who was robbed by you know the beaten by the robbers right someone who needs help and uh once uh i had that understanding you know if jesus were to come visit right now for just brief hours you know my, my thought is where would he visit you know obviously there will be a lot of people who want to host him but from the way the gospels describe the places he hung out and the people he associated himself with would be the urban poor, the marginalized uh, of our time. So once I made that, uh, it wasn't that difficult kind of a process me moving into and uh, becoming their neighbors. Yeah, thank you. There was a question in the chat and we've got about um, a couple of minutes here maybe for uh, one question here. And one of our participants asked the question, wasn't the Jerusalem of Acts 1-8 a scary place? Many were persecuted and martyred. So how do we not romanticize Jerusalem? Maybe David Fitch, would you want to, would you want to start that one? Uh, <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm going to call on Karen Wilk for that oh. one. Give me two minutes. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. Thanks, Dave. It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> well, one of the things I would say is that in working with many people who have very much been in, I can call it the Christian bubble, even stepping out and being attentive to having a conversation with eating amongst their neighbors that in itself is feels like a risk and an adventure and a challenge um i've even had pastors say what do i say to my neighbor i don't even know how to start a conversation so all that to say that just stepping out of the the comfort zone of our christian communities for many is the beginning of the risk and that i think it's also and more importantly an invitation to trust and discover that God is indeed at work ahead of us amongst and in and with our neighbors. Thank you. Yes, Tehu. I think uh, actually Luke does not romanticize Jerusalem. Hmm. It's uh, us 21st century, especially Western, mostly white Christians who tend to romanticize Jerusalem, right? Uh, if you actually read Acts chapter 2 and 4 and on, uh, it was chaotic. Uh, apostles were not in control of anything. 
Uh, this was uh, uncharted water. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, so they had, the only thing that was certain was that the Holy Spirit was out and about leading them, breaking barriers. I'm pretty sure that was a pretty scary thing because uh, their taboos and all the kosher laws were just uh, out the window. And the thing is, because we are so uh, complacent, and as many of you mentioned, because we are in this uh, Christian bubble, we don't see that chaotic, kind of fearful process. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are going to be like the apostles following the lead of the Holy Spirit, uh, we'll experience that. And all four of us have been through that. But I think we can say is that, yeah, we didn't know what we are into. Uh, we didn't have a map or a flow chart. But Shut hey, up. when I look back, <laughs> God has been really faithful. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. Such yeah. a great word. I'll just add to it, Tehu, that uh, Willie Jennings has written a great commentary on the book of Acts, which does, describes and unravels all of what Tehu was just teaching okay. us about Acts. That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to each of you for, for taking time to respond. And one thing I do want to, before we transition here, I want to note that David Fitch, uh, David Fitch's video is actually going to be available or is available under the Expo tab. So you can definitely go visit that section and make sure that you get a chance to listen to his full plenary talk. So thank you again to each of you. There are many great questions that we haven't gotten to in the chat, but I'm going to encourage you to please follow up with further reading and contact and resource information so you can keep these conversations moving and living within your context. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to invite each of our speakers to close us off with a summary statement. So this is something that um, we're asking you if we are to carry something away from this as a just remember this or a question that we can take to our table conversations, um, what would you leave with us? So we'll let each of our panelists chime in here for just a minute or so. Um, Karen, well, could I please start with you? All right. I would say we need to shift our piece from programs and pews and paid staff and professionalism to presence and postures and practices, proximity, and place. Thank you, Karen. And uh, David Lundberg? Well, uh, one of the things that we have seen in the church is it's been tradition dependent for centuries, but it really grew during that time until recently. And now the North American church seems to be in trouble, shrinking and aging. Um, and our, our sort of dry, brittle forms may not be working for this era. And so when we experiment, listen, obey, God will open up before us endless possibilities, renewed energy, uh, fresh perspectives, and hopefully a revitalized future. And so uh, I'm aware that God's been inviting us all along. And now maybe we are listening and hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit in some new, fresh ways. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. What about you? What would you leave us with? Well, I would say uh, when the crowd was out in the wilderness, you know, the disciples told Jesus, let them go somewhere and buy some food. And Jesus told them, you give them something to eat which is totally uh, nonsense and countercultural. But that's what Jesus kind of told all of us, you know, you give them, David, Tehu, Karen, and David Lundberg, you give them something to eat. And uh, in our culture, we are so used to checking my bank account and my resources before we even start to go out and feed people. But we don't need to have something because God has plenty. And as long as we heed the call to 
feed these hungry people spiritually and physically, uh, God's going to show up. That's right. Thank you, Tehu. And David Fitch. Yes, a uh, hearty amen to everyone. And uh, I, I have learned, the biggest thing I've learned in my life in the last 25 years is, is the way God works. It's through his presence. And I, I believe in the West, particularly United States, Canada, Europe, the West. We have architected God presence out of our existence. We've become busy. We've depended on our bank accounts. We've said, I need to do this or no one else is going to get it done. And we haven't allowed space for God's presence to work, not only in our lives, but especially in the spaces between us and all the other people and systems and things that God, that we live in. So let us be faithful to God's presence and, and allow him to work in our lives and in our neighborhoods. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David and David, <laughs> Karen, Tehu. Um, we're, we're just an hour into our Glocal 2021 20, time. And you know what? Even though we've had the glitches, this has been rich already. So thank you to each one of you. And so, friends, we are going to now move to our table conversations. And I realize that this might be an easy time to shut off your computer and call it a night or just be done for your afternoon, depending on your time zone. But we really encourage you, dig a little deeper. Maybe this virtual table that you're invited to is just the thing that will help you ground what you've heard, what you've learned in these contexts to live into your context too. Awesome. So we're now going to move over to our table conversations. How do you get there, you might ask? Well, again, look over on the left side of your screen where you see those tabs. You'll, the Expo tab, again, is where David's talk is going to be, but don't click that one. You're going to click the Sessions tab. Once you click there, you're going to leave the stage area, and you'll be brought to Sessions. And in that area, you're going to see several options. And you'll look for and find the table number you are assigned in an email, or this will be your table number throughout the conference, or if you're participating as part of a group, then look for your group name rather than the table number. If you can't find it, you get lost, don't worry, go into the event chat and let us know and we'll try to get you on your way as quick as possible. That's right. So it's been a great start to the summit, y'all. Rich and I will see you tomorrow, Friday, back here on the stage at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. So again, left toolbar, click on that sessions tab, pick your table number or group name, and just enjoy the last half hour at these tables. Now, you're going to have table hosts who will be there to guide you for these next moments together. So thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow.